This is Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. Welcome to the podcast, Chris Graham. Scott German, my co-host. It's Friday. It's uh, Duke UVA Eve here uh, in the Mid-Atlantic states, and um, we have uh, the the two number one teams in the country. I heard this last night, Scott. It's the fourth meeting all time between two teams, both ranked number one at the same time in the two polls. Uh, so uh, historic in that sense, and uh, of course these two teams uh, uh, will play twice this season. First game will be in Durham tomorrow at six o'clock, and um, I don't know, Scott. Uh, you know, with with this being the first game, we don't know what to expect between these two teams that have so much in common. Of course, the one thing they don't is the tempo they play, but these two teams are very similar. They both operate around big threes, as I like to call them. Uh, you know, three really good players. They kind of build around that 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 trio on each side, and uh, two great coaches, and uh, just two great rosters in general. And uh, boy, this should be this should be an interesting one tomorrow night. Oh, I agree. It could be uh, <clears throat> it could be a classic, or it could be a you know, a clunk. Who knows? Um, I think being the irrational for any fans that we know we both are. We got to keep telling ourselves it's just one game, and these these teams could meet, could easily meet four times this year, twice regular season, ACC tournament, NCAA tournament. So this is kind of like a heavyweight fight. Um, yeah, it would be nice to win round one, kind of establish some 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 confidence there. But if we don't, we can't be you know thinking that the sky's falling in, which we will. We know we will, but uh, it should be fun. Um, um, I think both teams will be amped for the game. And, it, and, it, and again, sometimes these games don't live up to the hype. They're not as well played as you would think they would be. Uh, a, a close game could turn into a rout by one team or another. So, you know, it's, it's going to be fun. The next 24 hours is going to be, going to be uh, kind, of, kind, of, kind of interesting. This is a matchup of teams. When you look at the KenPom.com efficiency ratings, which I do all the time, I do way too much, in fact. Uh, these are two teams that are uniquely positioned. We talked about the fact that it's two number one teams playing each other. It's also two teams, though, from the efficiency standpoint. Both offenses and defenses rank in the top five nationally. There are 353 teams in Division One. Virginia's offense is ranked third in efficiency. Uh, Duke's offense ranked fourth in efficiency. Virginia's defense ranked second in efficiency, and the the uh, their their uh, defense ranks fourth in efficiency at Duke. So I mean, you're talking about you know you know whether the game's close or not. I think it should be a pretty clean game, just because of the fact. I mean, you're not talking about like you know one team is all off, and this is what the narrative from ESPN and, and the national scene is. Duke is all offense and Virginia is all defense. Well, that's not quite the case. Yeah, Duke plays, you know, they score 90 points a game and uh, they play 75 possessions a game, which is a key for that. And Virginia gives up 51 a game and they only play 60 possessions a game. But again, the, uh, the, the efficiency numbers suggest these two teams are, except for the tempo, they're mirror images of each other. And uh, now we'll talk about personnel in a second, but just from, a, from an efficiency standpoint, these are... Right now, I mean, I'm looking at the others. Michigan State has two top ten. They're fifth on offense, eighth on defense. Gonzaga first on offense, 43rd on defense. And kind of, I want to give you this feel. Tennessee second on offense, 25th defense. Michigan 21st offense, third defense. You know, you look at the other top ten teams, they do one thing well. And the other thing, they do okay. These two teams do both well. And uh, it suggests that uh, they're going to be around for a while this year. You know, I think Duke, you know, we talked about it earlier, Duke's playing better defense, more, a little, little better team defense. I don't know if that was clearly on display against Syracuse, although that, you know, that was a little misleading game as far as total points in the game, the final score, rather, because it was an OT game, and there was a lot of suggestions in that game. So that might have been a little bit of, a little bit misleading, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's, clearly going to be um, a, a battle of I think it's going to come down to a battle of stars in this game when I, you know, we talked on Tuesday um, about the matchup against Tech and I, and I said I thought the keys to the Tech game for Virginia would be the play 
play in the three, the, the three, uh, the three reserves, Clark, Key, and Huff. And as it turned out, all three played uh, wonderfully in that game, contributed to, uh, contributed heavily. I think it's going to be a little different. Well, I think tomorrow's game uh, is going to come down to just a battle of teams, stars, and we can talk about it a little bit later. But I, I've got a, my key to the game tomorrow is a little bit slant than what we what I came up with uh, against Tech. So uh, you know, we can talk about that when, as we progress through this podcast. Yeah, I think a key, a, a, so. Let's talk. Let's start talking personnel and how this might play out. Uh, a, the biggest uncertainty right now, and it wasn't an uncertainty this time yesterday, but we're, we're recording this podcast. It's about 9.45 a.m. Friday morning. The word as of right now is that Trey Jones is is still uncertain for tomorrow's game. It was, as of yesterday, the, 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 the certainty was he was not going to play in this game. He'd be out for several weeks. And and Coach K dropped on a, to the Atlantic in an interview yesterday that uh, he's not ruling him out for this game. He's likely out for this game, but he'll be back soon. I wonder, one, if that's just Coach K trying to throw a, wrink- a wrinkle uh, into Tony Bennett's planning uh, because, you know, with Jones out, there's a lot of uncertainty about how Duke will approach this game without their point guard. There's not another natural point guard on that roster, so they'd have to you know, move some guys around to, to get through this game from a personnel standpoint. Uh, you know, I looked at this morning, Scott, right before we got on the uh, podcast here, uh, I guess Duke practicing this morning, and uh, uh, Jones was at practice. Uh, he was doing some individual drills, uh, reportedly, uh, not any detail as to what he was doing. Basically, the big news is he's not wearing a sling anymore. I don't know that that means you're going to be playing against the number one team in the country tomorrow, uh, but uh, that does, you know, it does kind of make it harder and it makes it even harder for Tony and, and the coaching staff to get ready because if you don't know the status of Trey Jones, uh, Duke can go so many different ways with this, and um, uh, it's, it's it's just kind of hard to get a handle on what you need to do game planning wise. Well, and, that, and you kind of stole so much thunder. So yeah, absolutely. And we don't. Man. I think I think uh, uh, Shashevsky is certainly playing this. Uh, Close to the vest, he's a tactician on this. He's not going to show show his hand right now. He's going to keep it up in the air. So Coach Bennett has to plan. Uh, uh, can't really game plan. Has to game plan for a couple different ways. But I, you know, as we just been talking about that, I think that if you know that's going to be a huge factor for him, not necessarily on offense uh, for Jones, even though he's a point guard. We talked about him distributing the ball, but. Uh, without him in the game, I think it's going to really create um, some some very difficult defensive matchups with Duke. Because if you remember last year, um, the win down in Cameron, um, we played the last five, six, seven minutes. I'm not certain uh, without Hunter, he came down on a player's foot, maybe maybe slight twist of his ankle. Yeah. Um, um, you know, if Jones is out. Um, that may that may really create some problems for Duke to the extent that they might have to start playing a little bit. Um, and if that happens, you should be able to have a uh, the other should be able to have a field day with that if they go if they go man and I, and I assume they might. Uh, how do they guard the rest of the team? You know, uh, I think that that the this concerns for Duke because not as much on offense as it is what matchups. What terrible defensive matchups is going to create if he indeed does not play, and, and so you know, I think tomorrow is going to be a game that where it's going to come down to the stars, and I think you're going to really see DeAndre Hunter step up big time tomorrow. You know, there's going to be a ton, again a ton of scouts in the building, uh, and tomorrow's going to be a time for DeAndre to shine, regardless of whether Jones is in the game or not. You know, I'll, I'll say it this way. I wrote a column about this last night. The, the more thinking you put to this this game and, and this particular game, because I think if if Jones is is questionable for tomorrow, I guess if we're using NFL terminology, he'll be ready uh, for the game in, in February in Charlottesville. So that game, you'll you'll assume will play more straight up. But the more I look at the matchups for tomorrow's game, assuming Jones is out, and I'm going to assume he's out, even with the talk that he might be available. If he was in a sling yesterday and he's out of a sling today and, and Duke wants to play him, 
good luck with that. Uh, you, you know, you got a you got an injured guy who hasn't played, all, hasn't practiced all week, uh, who who's going to play against the number one team in the country, uh, you know, team with a top five offense, top five defense. Good luck with all that. Um, so I'm assuming he's out, uh, and that Coach K is is doing some gamesmanship there. So uh, I'm assuming that there's going to be some zone sprinkled in from Duke, and here's why I assume that. I started looking at the matchups, and I think the guy who actually is most exposed in this game, if Trey Jones isn't part of this, is actually Zion Williamson. And, and, and from the standpoint of if if Jones is out, either lineup that, that Coach K goes with will have to go with to account for the absence of Jones is going to have Williamson playing the three defensively. He's not. He, he's been playing the four defensively. He's 6'7", 285. So there's a good reason he's playing the four because, you know, he's he's big boy, big guy. Uh, and but if you if, if Jones isn't there, you probably end up sliding Barrett over to play a point forward type role. You know he's going to bring the ball to the court, he'll initiate the offense, and he'll slot around. Um, and you have Reddish as the other guard at that stage, and then Williamson has to be the small forward. And you're either going to have Jack White and Alex O'Connell sort of as I mean they'll be basically a four guard lineup. They'll be on the floor to, to space the floor and shoot threes. Uh, or you'll have Marquis, Marquise Bolden uh, and Javin Delorier on the floor, and you'll go really, really big, you know, 6'10", 6'11", guys. Um, but either way you go with that, you know, Williamson is, is going to have to play the three, because if not, then, it, you know, if you got the big lineup, are you going to put Delorier on DeAndre Hunter? Are you going to put Marquise Bolden on DeAndre Hunter? Heck no, you're not. And if, and if you got White and O'Connell on the floor, you don't put either of them on Hunter. You got to put Williamson on Hunter in any of those scenarios. And so, if you got to put Williamson on Hunter, you're exposing Williamson. He's a shot blocker. He's a good post defender. But is is he going to be able to keep up with DeAndre on the perimeter? I don't think so. I think you're going to expose him to foul trouble. So I look at all that and say, you got to go zone. And I don't know for the whole game, but you're going to have to have zone in your plan if you're Coach K uh, to keep. Basically, to keep Zion Williamson from having to chase DeAndre Hunter around, that's not that's not a good look for him. He's not going to play that position in the NBA, and he's he's going to be a low post guy in the NBA. He's not going to want to be chasing DeAndre Hunter around for 40 minutes, uh, you know, t- tomorrow night in, in Durham. So uh, that's so I, I'm thinking. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm a smart guy, but Tony Bennett's a lot smarter than me. I'm thinking Tony's got to be working some zone offense into this uh, this week's practice because. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's now when you, if you, if you're Duke and you go zone, you're conceding that the game's going to be a slow game. You're conceding a low possession game if you do that. But, you know, I'm, I think coach, coach K is a lot smarter than me too. But I, I, if I'm coach K, I'm looking at Zion Williamson and saying, I don't want him chasing DeAndre Hunter around the whole game. I've got to win this game. I want to win this game and, and zone might be the best way to go about doing that. Well, that's possible. Uh, you know, I was thinking about something um, last night, uh, thinking about the game, and just kind of playing out matchups in my head and playing out personnel. So two weeks ago, what would be the likelihood that that anyone would be thinking about personnel matchups against good and have these two players um, mentioned in the same breath? Jay Huff and Zion Williams. Yeah, but you know the, the play that Jay has given us, the quality minutes off the bench. Uh, he he could be very instrumental in in in, in you know getting uh, if, if getting uh, Williams away from the basket, which would certainly open up a lot more inside play for the guards. Uh, um, you know he's able, he's able to use his size to frustrate. Things and uh, maybe altering your shot, things like that. I mean, who would have thought two weeks ago we would even be? I mean, the only way that Huff is getting off range two weeks ago is if you know again if he's playing with our green team. But now we're talking about Huff being a pivotal rotation member uh, in this game tomorrow, and he could be. Um, if Duke plays that, we can put Huff in the middle, and he can eat them up. Um, you know, it, having him contribute off the bench, in my opinion, it, it made this team a such a, a an incredible team for for opposing teams to, to defend. 
you know, I haven't written about Jay, but I'm going to have to do this today because you bring up a good point there. If Duke goes big, and you, you know, and, and of course, both big threes are going to play as close to 40 as possible for both sides. I just imagine, you know, for Virginia, you know, Jerome and Guy and Hunter are going to play 35 plus. The Duke kids, uh, Barrett and Williamson and, and Reddish, are going to play 35 plus. So, uh, but you, for Duke, they've got the two distinct groups. And again, I'm assuming when I say this that Jones isn't playing, and he's not going to play. Uh, if you ask me, I'm, I'm not. He's not reported that, but I'm telling you, he's not going to play. Uh, uh, you, you know, you go again with the three-point shooters, the six-six-six-seven guys, White and O'Connell, or you go big. You go six-ten-six-eleven to Laurier and, and Bolden. And in that scenario, with a big lineup that Duke goes to, the counter is is Jay Huff. Uh, at least he's part of the counter. Yeah, he's he's the guy you have him on the floor with either Salt or or Diakite, uh, along with uh, uh, Jerome and, and Guy and and Hunter and uh, and yeah, you're right. If they go zone, then you you, you well, you, Huff can play two roles there. He can still be the guy sliding down on the baseline as a as a danger. Uh, if Duke is playing zone and you have Hunter maybe in the middle at the foul line and uh, for the high-low pass, you could do an alley-oop to Huff with his athleticism and height. Uh, he's a danger there. If you put him in at the post, uh, at the high post there at the foul line, he's an inviting target to throw the ball to. And and then he either shoots the little 12-foot jump shot like Hunter uh, is, is so adept at or he uh, dumps down or dumps out to the wing. Uh, and if they're man, you know, him, he and Delorier – are a good matchup. I like that matchup for Virginia. If if he's in the game at the same time, Delorier and he's he's checking Delorier on the one end, and he's available for help side help side uh, defense too on on Williamson. You know the the post double is going to be really important in this. And let's, I, I'll kind of shift it now to talking about defending Zion Williamson. This has been a concern of mine, Scott, since November. The first couple times I watched Duke play, I'm starting to think who who on Virginia goes man to man with with Zion Williams because of course Virginia goes man Virginia will not zone and uh, uh, it's a, it's a badge of honor that you you play your man uh, but one way that happens is uh, you know if you, you if, if the ball's in the post uh, with a with a good post offensive player Virginia does that post to post double uh, and you that's so few teams do a post to post double and what that for the fans out there you you've seen this before if you're not familiar with the the, the thinking the terminology. Uh, you know, so just imagine the ball is in, in Zion Williams' hands. He's he's backing his way in in the post. He's just outside the lane, uh, and he's got his man. Let's say it's Hunter uh, that's guarding him straight up. Well, what what a lot of teams do is they'll drop the guard down. So if if the pass comes from the wing in the into the post on the on the block, uh, a lot of teams, most teams, in fact, will if they double, they'll double with the guard. They'll send the guard down to double. Uh, so the guard comes from the same side of the floor, and you 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 you're coming from two different angles, but you're trying to get the ball of the guy's hands from there. Well, what, of course, his first entry, or his first exit pass from that is back out to the wing for an open three. Virginia does it differently. They will not double with the the the, the guard from the same side of the floor where the ball just got dumped in. They'll send a po- the other post defender from across the lane uh, to double from there, and what then you do is everybody behind the play rotates. Uh, you know, you have a guard who's on the other side of the floor guarding someone on that wing. They'll jump, they'll jump back down and help with the, the post pass. So if, if there's a post dive, you know, if, that, if, if the guy who's being left open by the post double, you, you'll send Kyle Guy, you'll send Ty Jerome down just to break the pass up. They're not going to necessarily be a post defender, but they're taking away that quick dive play. And what advantage there is there, Zion Williamson, 6'7". He's got DeAndre Hunter, 6'7", on him. If you've got Mamadi Diakite at 6'9", Jack Salt at 6'10", or Jay Huff at 7'1", doubling with the other tall player, it makes it really hard to pass out of that. You almost just have to pass it back out front. That, of course, slows your, your offensive flow down. It takes more seconds off the shot clock uh, and eventually discourages teams from throwing the ball in the post in the first place. Uh, and so, yeah, that's where Jay Huff can play a role, and that's how you defend Zion Williams is is that that post to post double. So that's going to be key. You're going to see a lot of post to post doubles tomorrow night with Zion Williamson, and it'll be interesting to see. I'm sure the scouts there are going to be looking to see how does he react to post to post doubles because he's going to see a lot of those in the NBA. 
offers, yeah, for sure. And you know, that that's a very common defensive topic in the NBA. Uh, so I'm sure that I'm going to have the notebooks out tomorrow, looking at some of that's a dream matchup if you're an NBA scout. It really gives you an indication of uh, of how well he can handle it. And now, going back to the, the, the defensive uh, adjustments, you know, we we won down there. We won in Cameron last year, and we, we basically only had three scoring threats on the floor at times, or well, maybe sometimes we had four, but we never had five guys who score. Um, this year's offense is so much better to guard. Duke, you know, we talk about this defense. I'll, I'll grant you that it is better. But Virginia's offense is better too. Uh, I mean, this is by far the, the most explosive offensive team that Duke will face this year, in my opinion, because all five out on the floor most of the time from Virginia offensive threat. Um, and without Jones, I think Duke will have a hard time stopping Virginia unless they just really have a bad shooting, like three or four players have a bad shooting. That's why I think this is the game that extremely winnable for Virginia because it's just unlikely they're going to play these defense tackles in Virginia everywhere they go. And I just can't imagine you're going to have enough guys have off night that, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to do, we're going to do well tomorrow night. Yeah. See, and, and I, 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 I'm the wet blanket, and I'm the guy who said that the Tech game would be close and it wasn't, so keep that in mind. But I'll say um, I, I – yeah, I'm, I'm not throwing in that Virginia is going to have this great offensive night if if Trey just because Trey Jones is not in the game. I'm not one who's sold on the idea that Trey Jones is a great defensive player. I know that Jay Billis, the ESPN folks, have been selling that notion for a while. And yes, he averages I think it's 3.7 steals per game, so great. Um, his defensive rating is the lowest among the Duke regulars, and I think there's a reason for that. Defensive rating is is how many points per possession you're, the guy you're guarding scores. And uh, he has the highest number uh, on the Duke on the Duke roster. Um, and so, how could that be? Well, he averages 3.7 steals a game. How can it be that he's, he gives up the most points per possession of anybody on the Duke roster? When you when you're out there stealing the ball, now you, you know it's not like on the playground where you just go up to a kid and you steal the ball from him. You know, steals at the college and pro level are often guys who are they're 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 kind of taking chances. I mean, they're either you know. Uh, stealing the ball from the other other team, but most likely they're sticking their hands in passing lanes. And to do that on a regular basis, you've got to gamble a bit. And if you gamble and you you fail, uh, your guy scores, or at least he has a good shot. Let's just put it that way. They don't they don't always score, but you know if you gamble and, and and you come up short, you're leaving a guy open for a three. You're you know you're letting the guy get to the rim for a layup or a dunk. You know, and that's how that's how he can. Be you know he can be leading uh, the ACC and among the best in the country stealing the ball and and also giving up the most points per possession uh, as a, as a Duke defender. Um, you know I look at now yeah that, that when adjusting for him being out I mean he, they would love him to be in the game because he's he gives you 35 minutes a game he runs the offense and I think that's where he's the difference maker for this team. And I've been saying that since November that with when you have three guys on the floor like they've got the three top picks. Uh, Williamson and Barrett and and Reddish, somebody's got to pass the ball. Not all five guys can score. There's one basketball on the floor at a time, uh, and, and it can only be shot once per possession. You know, unless you get an offensive rebound, and then it's still it can only, only be shot once at a time. Um, and Jones is so good at that. Uh, he averages uh, something like seven assists a game. He only averages one turnover a game. Uh, he he doesn't make mistakes offensively. Uh, he gets the ball in the right spaces offensively. And we saw the other night, now, yeah, Syracuse scored 95 points. That game had 91 possessions. So that wasn't a terrible game from a defensive standpoint, a little more than a point per possession. But, you know, Virginia's had games like that. In fact, Virginia Tech scored more than a point per possession. They had 59 points on 54 possessions. So, you know, pace of game, uh, we had a similar defensive effort against Virginia Tech as Duke had against Syracuse. We just had a much more efficient offensive effort. Uh, But... uh, where Duke bogged down Monday night against Syracuse was Trey Jones is not there, and, and they had uh, 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 R.J. Barrett running the point. Your point guard that night shot the ball 30 times. He was 8 for 30 from the field. Uh, James Harden does that. Scott, you and I watched the Rockets and the Nets on TV the other night. 
James Harden get away with that, though, because he'll score 58 when he shoots it that many times. He shot the ball 34 times, had 58 points. Barrett shot the ball 30 times, had 23 points. If that's what your offensive strategy is going to be, uh, and having Barrett play the point, it probably is going to be Barrett playing the point tomorrow, he's got to pass the ball, and the kid does not seem to have a, a, a passing bone in his body. That's the big problem for Duke tomorrow night, in my opinion, is that it's not what you know Jones means for them defensively. It's what Jones means for them offensively, and who passes the ball on this team. Yeah, if that, if, Chris, if that's Duke's offensive game plan tomorrow, then game, set, match, Virginia. Because they're going to give them, Virginia's defense is going to give that, that the offensive strategy fits all night long. You know, when I was watching the game, and I actually was watching some post game. Uh, Monday night on not ESPN, but Fox Sports. And they were talking about the one thing that Williams um, probably needs to work on a little bit is it, and he seems to get tired in games. He looked tired at the end of the course of the hot possession game, overtime game. He looked tired, but he also, they also showed some highlights the other days that he often looked a little, he was not as active in the second half. Now, if that is indeed the case, um, the West Virginia runs, you know, so many multiple screens and cuts on every possession. Um, and if Jones doesn't play, it's going to mean the additional minute for the other starters. Um, it might take a half or 30 minutes to break him, but eventually, um, you know, he's going to be out of gas. So, you know, another, another problem not having Jones on the floor is going to create is that Jones doesn't starters that we talked about are going to have to play more minutes, and Virginia wears you out. We talked about that. The way Virginia plays defense uh, <clears throat> and the way they run their offense, they just wear you out. They don't want you to to play off. They don't want you to pass off. Uh, if you do, they penalize you. They, they, they score. So, um, yeah, that, that, you know, Jones just creates a lot of problems for Duke if he's not in the game. Personally, I don't think he's going to play. Um, I think if his injury was that bad on Monday night, why do you – I mean, it's, we know Kia Carter came back, but he was out. He had 10 days or so to actually healed. Um, you know, why put him out there in a game, one game that, as we just talked about earlier, one of possibly four games this season in Virginia, why put him out there in the middle of January to risk maybe really creating a season-ending injury? I don't even think Coach K would do that. Well, and he's proven recently that Cam Reddish missed the uh, Monday game with Syracuse with flu-like symptoms. You know, if that was a March game, uh, he'd have played. But, you know, they didn't play him. Uh, Williamson ha had the uh, poke in the eye at, at Florida State and sat out the second half. It looked like he could have played, but they didn't put him out there. So I, I, I just think that what we're doing here is playing some mind games. And I like it. It's fine. It's kind of like Bill Belichick in the NFL. Um but that, I think that what you said, Scott, about about how Virginia runs its offense, and you have to wear, you know, so many people who don't follow the program closely, just look at the scores and hear about the defense, they think, oh, they make you work on defense. That's all they do. No, they make you work on offense. You know, of course, the folks listen to this podcast almost 30 minutes in. You guys know this well. You, you folks know this well because, you know, it's not just what they do, what the Virginia defense does on that end, uh, making you work so hard to get a shot off. Then on the other end, when you play man-to-man -man defense against a motion offense, the mover blocker offense, and you've got two guys setting screens like every other second, and you've got Kyle Guy running a marathon out there, uh, running from screen to screen, side to court to side of the court, uh, when when Jer Jerome does basically the same thing after he dishes the ball, uh, you know if that's where I say if Williamson is having to guard Hunter and Hunter's in the game as a three. See, the Virginia offense, you know, we're used to in basketball talking about guards, two guards, two forwards, and a center. Virginia plays three guards and two forwards. Uh, and the two forwards set screens, and the three guards run off screens. And Hunter, if he's playing at the three, he's on the perimeter. He's running off those screens just like Jerome and Guy are. And if you're Zion Williamson at 6'7", 285, having to run through screens, for 35 minutes chasing DeAndre Hunter around. Good luck. I've been saying this for a while. As soon as that kid, as talented as he is and everything else, he's, he's, he's no question he's a supreme talent.
Zion Williams I'm talking about. But when he gets in the NBA, the first thing he's going to be told to do is lose 25 pounds. That 285 is a good 285 if you're playing football. It ain't a good 285 if you're being asked to play 35 minutes of basketball. He played 43 minutes against Syracuse. And, Scott, you noted he looked tired in the second half. He wasn't the same Zion Williamson. Well, that was against Syracuse, who plays zone defense. Virginia doesn't play zone defense. Virginia makes you work your butt off when you got the ball on the offensive end. And if you're going to be playing man-to-man defense, you're going to be working twice as hard. That's why I think, I'm just saying it, I'm just thinking that, that zone's going to be, if not the, what we see coming out of the gate for Duke, it's going to be something that, that Coach K has worked on this week with this group, and he's going to pull it out of his pocket if Virginia starts getting too efficient offensively first half, maybe in the second half, as a, as a change-up kind of thing. But he's got, to, he's got to have something in his pocket there because those three guys chasing Virginia guys around for 35, 40 minutes, it's just not going to work for Duke. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it, it, it's, 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 but all these things we're talking about, chess match kind of things. I want to throw one other thing out there, Scott. We talked about Kia Clark, and he played such a huge role uh, in, in Tuesday's win, obviously. Uh, we talked about it on our podcast, Previewing the Game, that Kia Clark needs to play 25, 30 minutes, and he needs to go out there and guard Justin Robinson and get in his shirt. And he did. He drew a technical foul eventually because Robinson was so frustrated. Rob, if anybody out there wants to claim you had – uh, Kia Clark and Justin Robinson scoring nine points each in that game, then you're lying because you didn't have that. But that's what happened. Clark had nine. He held he held Robinson to nine. He got a technical foul called on him, um, and that was key to the win. Here's what I'm saying, Scott, though. You might have seen this in one of my columns this week, but without Jones in the game for Duke, I'm not sure Clark has much of a role in this game. I want to get your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, he may not because <clears> – <throat> Certainly not going to be, you know, as as necessary to be pressing, you know, to be pressuring the the, the ball as much. Uh, I think he will play uh, if Jones doesn't play. I think there'll be. I think Tony will have a role. So if, if nothing else, you know, again he'll be out there. He'll be he'll be maybe a factor into wearing Duke down because I really believe at the end of this game, uh, even with Jones. Um, that 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 stamina is going to come into a to into play, and I think Tony will throw everything he can at him, especially if, if you don't see Jones out there. Um, then it will just be even more reason for 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 Kia to be guarding, to be pressing that ball at the point there. So I, I think he'll play. I think he'll play. I think this is, how much he plays, the significance of his minutes, whether he's going to be required to. Needed to, to be an offensive threat. I think he's just going to be out there um, creating, you know, the intensity that's just going to wear on Duke as the game progresses. You know, another thing we haven't talked about, only, you know, I'm not sure. You know, Williams, it's a no-brainer. I mean, he, he's going to, defending him is going to be a major chore uh, for the Cavaliers. I mean, regardless of who gets the who's, who's assigned to DeAndre Hunter, uh, he's the same height. He's basically the same height as Williams. Williamson, he's six seven, but he's about sixty pounds lighter. He, 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 he can get a couple of inches taller, but he's sixty pounds lighter. If you put salt on him, um, you know, he's certainly got six ten, two fifty. He certainly has the the, the the presence of being able to, to match up with him physically, but. I'm sure. I'm sure he doesn't have the quickness to stay with him for a long-term basis. But, but the, the intangible here that I think we're missing is that. So what if he goes off and scores 35 points? He got 35 points against Syracuse and they lost. Um, the rest of the team shot 30 percent from the field. Um, so is it a case where you don't really worry about him that much offensively? Oh no! You, if you're Virginia, the way you know the game is going to be a slow paced game. I don't think it's going to be <laughs> okay. Let me, let me say it. It's not that I don't think it's going to be a slow pa- or a fast paced game. It's not going to be a fast paced game. Uh, that game had 91 possessions, and he, so he can have 35 points in a 91 possession game and still lose because you, you know you have a lot of possessions to score points. This is not going to be anything close to that. Even if you take out the overtime, let's give them. Uh, 10 possessions in the overtime. That game was 80 or, or so possessions for the for the regulation time. That's two possessions a minute. This game's going to be about a, a, a possession and a half a minute. It's going to be about a 60-possession game. 
And so in a 60-possession game, 35 points would be, yeah, that would be ridiculous. Um, I think you you play to your strengths, and your strengths are you you know you don't. I mean, Tony doesn't let guys go off. Uh, they've got three guys who can go off. Now, really, two. Reddish hasn't found his his you know his footing in this group uh, because there's only one basketball on the floor at a time. He had a good game at Florida State when Williamson wasn't in the game in the second half uh, because there were more opportunities, and he did he did well. He got into a flow and got and did well, but. When all three of them are out there, Reddish is the third wheel of the three. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know that, you know, you can probably try to sneak Jack on him a little bit uh, defensively, but Williamson is is a guy that, okay, he's not going to dribble drive past uh, elite perimeter defenders like uh, DeAndre Hunter, who, I mean, let's remember, DeAndre Hunter uh, for stretches was also guarding Justin Robinson. DeAndre Hunter at 6'7 was, was guarding Justin Robinson, 6'2 point guard. I think second team All ACC last year at point guard. Uh, he guarded him for stretches too, uh, and, and he's going to probably be checking Zion Williamson a lot tomorrow night. So that tells you the versatility of of, of a guy like DeAndre Hunter. Uh, but uh, you know, so so Williams is not going to dribble drive around him when he when when he has Hunter on him, he's going to be trying to back him into the post. Uh, but when you have Jack Salt on on him, or even Diakite on him, Diakite is more certainly more flexible, more mobile than Jack Salt. Uh, he does give up 60 pounds just like uh, Hunter does. But uh, if, if you have Diakite on him or Salt on, on, on Williamson, you're going to see him try to take him off the dribble. Uh, he, he can get around those guys off the dribble. He can't get around Hunter off the dribble uh, with any kind of consistency. So um, he's that guy. that, that he's, That's where his versatility lies. Uh, he can make the three if he's wide open. It's a set shot. It takes it does a little bit of... Hitching a giddy up, as as I like to say, it takes him a couple seconds to get the shot off, but he can make it if he's wide open. Uh, so, you know, I don't know that you get away with too much except for off switches uh, with with either Diakite or Salt on him uh, because of his versatility. Um, you know, and getting back to Kihei for a second, uh, I think what limits his minutes is now, if they bring in Goldwire, who's a 6'2 point guard as a sophomore who doesn't play much, he plays like eight minutes a game. Uh, but if he's their changeup, kind of like Clark is our changeup, uh, I think you'll see Clark check him, and you I'll probably take him out of the lineup as a result of that. It's just hard for me to imagine that Kia Clark at 5'9 is going to guard. Now, I, I assume R.J. Barrett's their point guard tomorrow night. It's hard for me to imagine Kia at 5'9 guarding R.J. Barrett at 6'7. Um, and, and being effective at that. If he can be, then I'll, I'll never say another bad word about Kia Clark again, and I haven't said very many. Um, but he's giving up a foot there almost. He's giving up 10 inches on paper and probably actually a foot in real life. Um, if, if, he can, if he can be effective against, against R.J. Barrett, more power to him. Uh, it's just hard for me to imagine that defensively. And, and so... Uh, I think as a result, that that does change things up. I wonder if we maybe see more Marco Anthony tomorrow night as a result. Anthony at 6'5", about 220, more stout. Uh, he hasn't played a lot lately, but you know he, he stepped in in the past uh, with, with not having a lot of playing time. He had that game against Louisville last year, for example, where he hadn't played a lot in weeks before that game, had a great game in that one. So I wonder if we might see more, more Anthony uh, or just kind of go bigger, with uh, the, the the main subs being guys like Huff and Key, of course, and we haven't talked about Key, but Braxton Key could play a huge role in this one defensively. He is rated by the you know in the in the defensive ratings, he actually has the best defensive rating in the ACC. Um, and so at six seven six eight in his size, he can play an interesting role in this one. He might be the super sub tomorrow, and, and, and not necessarily Key Clark. Yeah, I mean we. Hey, the rich get richer. We keep, we we haven't we've gone forty some minutes, and we, I'm not sure we've even mentioned Braxton Key. We had you know that's terrible. <laughs> uh, you know we are we are in rarefied air when we we you know the, we had a great offensive team last year. We went out and signed a free agent essentially, yeah. and then he was eligible immediately. So uh, you know we we are. Uh, Doing something right, and and Keith, I think he will he'll get his minutes. I'm not going to sit here and predict or you know look at the crystal ball and say he's going to get X number of minutes, X number of points. He's going to be a vital cog out there because I think the the key here is 
especially without Jones, the key is going to be just to just flat out wear Duke out. And, and you have to throw bodies at him. He's going to be important in that probably eight man rotation. I don't, I don't see Marco Anthony getting in the game at all, to be honest. I, I really think he, his play has just not been anywhere near the level that we saw him at last year. Of course, he had the one great moment in the game against Louisville, but um, I don't see I don't see us going that deep. We'd have to go to the nine nine man rotation for that to happen. I don't I don't think that's going to happen. But uh, you know the the, the three headed monster that I came up against, I came up with that would be key to beating Tech, Clark, Key, Huff. I said earlier in the podcast I didn't think that was going to be the case. I thought we were going to see a game of stars. I still stay say that, and um, I, that's not to say that Clark, Key, and Huff won't have some important minutes, but I think it'll be those mundane things that you don't really notice in the box score. But I think it's the three-headed monster tomorrow is going to be our stars. It's going to be Ty Jerome. Uh, it's going to be Cal Guy. It's going to be DeAndre Hunter. Uh, and I think it's, it's the reason that's going to be, the reason I'm confident, the reason I'm going to stay here in just a few minutes that Virginia's going to win this game between five and ten points is that those three guys aren't going to be phased by whatever uh, the Cameron crazies throw at them. Uh, you know, Jerome is... is On the New York playgrounds, uh, we watched some of his confidence, his hockiness against Tech, you know, kind of chirping at the Tech bench after a three-quarter in the first half. Kyle Guy is just so competitive. Uh, just playing the game is so much fun. I can only imagine how, how, how he's looking forward to going down and, and, and embracing whatever Cameron Indoor Stadium tosses that he's bought. And Hunter, you know, is becoming – is such an iconic sort of player, um, you know, against Tech. What did he, what did, uh, I think DeAndre had 20 points, 21 points maybe? 21 on 8 of 12 shooting, um, yeah. 8 of 12, and he did it in all sorts of, you know, he drove, he, he shot, he, he had jump shot facing up on the perimeter, he posted up in fact, he did whatever he wanted, whatever he wanted against Virginia Tech. And I'll go out on the list and say, this Tech was much better than the team that did. In my opinion, we didn't see it Tuesday night in JPJ because we dismantled them in every shape and form. But uh, overall, I think that is probably just as good of a defensive team, if not better than Texas do. And Hunter had his way all 40 minutes against Tech Tuesday night. Yeah, he. You know, we hadn't talked to a lot of specific about him. Yeah, he he was 21 points, eight of 12 shooting. He and, and I, I like the fact that he's playing that kind of basketball going into this game uh, because he needs to be assertive tomorrow. And he's had stretches this year where he's not been assertive. And, uh, and for a guy now, you, you know, there are going to be a million scouts in the house tomorrow night. So uh, they're looking at, certainly they're looking at Williams and Barrett and Reddish, but they're looking at Hunter and they're looking at Jerome and guy. Uh, but Hunter is a guy that's has been talked about as a lottery pick uh, in, in this year's draft. If he comes out this year, uh, and if if that's the case, uh, these scouts will want to see him and how he competes with these Duke studs um, at that level. So, uh, you know, we hadn't talked a lot about Jerome and Guy. Uh, one thing I'll say is that I, I don't think we're going to see a lot of Key A. Clark tomorrow night. I think you'll see more Braxton Key, which, which means that Guy will be the shortest guy on the floor for most of the 35 to 40 minutes he'll be out there tomorrow night uh, at 6'2". And he's also small. I mean, he's not just sh- short at 6'2". He's about my size. I'm... I'm 6'1", about 180. He's 6'2", about 170. Uh, and and he's going to be, you know, from a physical standpoint, he's going to be out physical out there because he's going to be guarding probably Cam Reddish at 6'8", um, uh, for, for a good stretches of this game and and, and uh, be guarded by him too. So, uh, you know, he's going to have to get his shot off against a guy who's got six inches on him. Uh, and, uh, and I'll be, you know, I'm not worried about that. Just it will alter his game a little bit. Uh, he's going to have to get around a guy that's pretty quick. Um, and so, and, and from Jerome's standpoint, one advantage he's got is he's playing offense at point guard against a guy who doesn't play a lot of defense as a point guard. Uh, they have Trey Jones out there hawking uh, at the front, and it's going to have to probably be Barrett guarding uh, Jerome 
and uh, in a position where he's not used to, you know, not used to playing. He's going to have to, you know, that, that he, he, he's he's used to chasing guys around. He's going to have to, you know, he's going to have to front up on a guy that's an NBA point guard. Uh, Jerome's going to play in the NBA, so. Uh, you know, when, when he gets when Bear gets to the next level, he's not going to be asked to defend guys like Ty Jerome. So it's going to be a challenge for him too. And uh, so yeah, yeah, you know, we've talked so much about what Duke does and how Virginia defends Duke. Duke's got those challenges. They got to figure out how to guard those two guys, the best backcourt in the ACC. Yeah, what's the, what's the last time we? Well, I mean, we know it was last year, but. It's it's kind of for all time Virginia fans and knowing how Duke has had our number, it's kind of kind of fun to think that Duke may have more defensive challenges guarding us than we would than we do guarding them. That to me, that's a real uh, tell tell sign that our program has arrived. Yeah, I don't know if I'd say more, but certainly the same level. I mean, we're we're sitting here worried about how we defend Zion Williamson and you know R.J. Barrett, and he's an elite talent. They're worried about yeah, they're worried about Ty and, and Kyle and, and Hunter. They even have to worry about Jay Huff if he gets in the game. They got to worry about one of our like our seventh or eighth guy, uh, Braxton Key. Can't leave him open on threes. Uh, Mamadi Diakite uh, has had some. He had 18 points against Boston College, so you know. I don't know that you get the same consistency out of their non-big three. You know, you, 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 I don't know. I mean, you got to worry about Jack White and, and Alex O'Connell. Don't leave them open. Uh, but Marquise, Marquise Bolden and Javon Delorier, you know, you don't you don't game plan for them. But you've got to kind of you got to worry about Key. You've got to worry about Huff. You got to worry about Diakite, and you've got to worry about Virginia's big three. So so yeah, you said this earlier, Scott. But you know, except for Jack Salt. Uh, of the eight-man rotation, seven of the guys can score, and it, seven of the guys can put twenty on the board, and uh, and that's what's so different about this Virginia team. It is not, and Seth Greenberg's been saying this a lot lately. It's not your father's Virginia team. This is this is a Virginia team that is is built to play at the top level. Hey Chris, it's not even in my son is a, as you well know, the Hall of UVA fan. It's not even my son's UVA team. The team that I spoke to you all uh, under the Pete Gillen days and the late Jeff uh, and the late Jeff Jones tenure in Virginia. This is a team that has evolved from not the last fifty years, but just transformed into a completely different uh, program in the last ten years. One thing, too, just as we finish up here, um, you talked about all these. The, the, the scouts that are going to certainly be there and look at all the players. You know, what about Jay Huff? I think Jay Huff's starting to show up on the radar because you and I both watch a lot of NBA games. There's room in the NBA game for Jay Huff. If you can picture a couple years from now when he puts on some strength, puts on some body weight and gets his bulk built up, uh, I've seen a bunch of seven-footers in the NBA that play role minutes that, that uh, Jay Huff could easily develop into. Oh yeah, I'll 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 say that real quick because I know we got to we got to break off here. But yeah, I agree. Huff at seven-one with range out to the three-point line with uh, the hops he has because you know at seven-one he doesn't have to jump very high to dunk a ball, but he can he he does have athletic he can dunk from the foul line. We've all seen that video. From a couple of years ago, where he can he can you know do the do the foul line dunk that Jordan and J- Dr. J did, uh, so he's got athleticism, he's got height, he's got range. Uh, yeah, he's an NBA player. He's 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 still got work to do. There's a reason he went to UVA was to work on his defense and to get better defensively. He's got the offensive game. Nobody's ever questioned that about him. So so yeah, he's a guy. And, and tomorrow, you know, uh, uh, we, we we've seen lately how the offense is different with him on the floor. He's getting 10 minutes a game now. When he's out there, you've got to account for him. When he gets that entry pass at the at the top of the key, uh, when Jack Salt gets that pass, he's looking to either dribble a handoff or pass the ball to the wing. You've got to worry about Jay Huff shooting the three. You got to worry about him driving and dunking. So yeah, he's he's an NBA talent. There's no question about that. And yeah, it'd be interesting to see if if he gets if he gets a li- at least a little cameo role tomorrow night uh, and a chance to uh, to impress uh, the nation. Uh, with with his under the radar abilities. 
you know, how many of us thought that, uh, that when Malcolm Brogdon came to Virginia, Jeff, uh, Joe Harris came to Virginia, how many of us thought they would not only have NBA burgers to beat potential, I mean, Malcolm Brogdon was an all-star, rookie all-star. Joe Harris is going to be, you know, he's a starter for the new Brooklyn Nets. Uh, and they weren't seven foot tall. So you give Jay another couple of years in Tony's system. He's going to be NBA ready when his eligibility is. I can assure you that. Yeah, Joe is second in the NBA in three point shooting. Malcolm is somewhere around 10 or 12. But Malcolm's also putting up what's an interesting number uh, 50, he's a 50 40 90 guy. 50% plus from the field, 40% plus from three point range, 90% plus from. The foul line, of course, he's 97% from the foul line. He's only missed two free throws attempts this year. So uh, those two guys are definitely carrying the mantle. They'll be joined soon by some of the guys we're watching tomorrow night. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's fun to see those guys succeeding at the next level. I know, Scott, i got to let you get out of here. So uh, uh, I will tease to the fact that I, uh, that, that I want to do a podcast later today, also with Jerry Carter talking a little bit more on the Duke side of things, I suppose. Uh, I'll also tease from that one. That Scott and I had this conversation we're going to cover this game from all angles. And, of course, tomorrow we've got live blogs. Scott and I will get together after we've calmed ourselves down from the game. Uh, and we'll do a, a post-game uh, podcast. And we'll have Inside the Numbers. All kinds of stuff for for our fans out there, for our listeners and readers and everything out there. So, wow, this is a good time of year. UVA Duke. Any last thoughts, Scott? 75, 65, Jim, of course. I am not going to predict a score because I'm always bad at that. But uh, I think everything else I've got, we've helped get you ready and uh, glad to be able to do so. For Scott German, I'm Chris Graham. Be a nail <laughs> Scott, Scott's promising not going to be a nail biter. Uh, he's, he's been right about that lately. I've not been. So we'll, we'll, I'll leave you with that thought. And, and for Scott German, Chris Graham signing off. Wahoo wah.